Um, so it's kind of short, and I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm just going to dive right in. Here's an argument. This is the core argument that I'm going to make in the, the uh, talk today. And we'll see, because it's got two premises, or maybe, maybe some bits uh, in advance of each of them. Uh, first premise, uh, every descriptive conceptual analysis of causation has to save the phenomena of ordinary causal attributions. Uh, this is just a constraint on what uh, a descriptive conceptual analysis is going to be. And um, just be clear that I am talking about one variety of conceptual analysis. If you have something else in mind, right, if you have like um, uh, some kind of reconstructive analysis or ameliorative analysis, or uh, you think that analysis can include things like explication, that's not the sort of thing <coughs> I'm interested in. I'm talking about the descriptive ones that are supposed to somehow um, uncover what our core concept actually is, or what the full concept is, or something like that. Uh, okay, so uh, descriptive analyses are constrained in this way. Right? They've got to give us back at least most of our ordinary causal attributions, you know, or give us a, an explaining away story. Right? Um, uh, otherwise, they're just not going to be uh, acceptable as descriptive conceptual analysis. Uh, second premise, no uh, analysis of causation that has to do that work that has to save the phenomenon of the ordinary causal attributions is fit for doing realist material mode metaphysics of causation. Right? So if your goal is to do some kind of metaphysics in the, uh, in the vein of a bunch of contemporary um, philosophers working on causation, not all of them, but a bunch of them, then uh, this is a bad way to do it. <coughs> sort of attempt, attempting a, a conceptual analysis is a bad way to go. So uh, no descriptive conceptual analysis of causation is fit for doing realist material mode metaphysics of causation. Um, right. Since you're all on board, I expect actually most of you are on board, you probably could break at this point and go home. But I'm going to walk through why I think in particular these things are um, uh, the uh, this kind of conceptual analysis and the, the method that uh, goes along with it, right? this case-based method that uh, traffics in appeals to thought experiments and uh, making judgments about what's going on, what's causing what in various, um, sometimes ordinary and sometimes very bizarre uh, cases that we're considering why that just isn't going to work. It belongs in the rubbish bin relative at least to this goal of, of doing something like realist metaphysics. You might have some other goal in mind. There are lots of things that you might try to do with this sort of thought experiment method. I'll come back to that at the end of this talk. Um, I think there is some legitimate work for this to be done, but not this metaphysical thing. Okay, so background, so that we're sort of all on board about what exactly the target is and how this is supposed to go in, um, in a lot of literature from the early 70s up through now, um, a good deal, but not all, of contemporary work in metaphysics, mostly having to do with actual causation, and that's going to be the focus for me in this talk, um, as distinct from like figuring out causal laws or structural causation or some other uh, some other thing you might be interested in. Uh, that theorizing is constrained, and in many cases takes itself explicitly to be constrained by our ordinary causal attributions, and. By this, this is what I'll typically use, but it goes by a bunch of different labels that are more or less interchangeable in the literature. So you'll see people saying, appealing to their pre-theoretical intuitions, or the deliverances of common sense, or everyday judgments, or what the man on the street says, or something like this, right? Um, here's an example, and then I'll run through a bunch of people that I think are uh, sort of in the neighborhood of this, or either endorse this picture, or agree that this is um, the way things typically run today. Uh, so here's David Lewis writing um, sometime in the 1980s, and for this, and this is 86. Uh, when common sense delivers a firm and uncontroversial answer about a not too far fetched case, theory had better agree. If an analysis of causation does not deliver the common sense answer, that is bad trouble. Okay. Um, and so the cases that I'm going to give, I hope, are going to be not too far fetched and where. Um, the ordinary judgments that participants are giving are going to be firm and uncomfortable. What's the convention about taking questions during the talks? Is that okay? Do you want to do 
The mere fact that you could ask this question quite <laughs> <laughs> So could you just maybe say something more to kind of motivate this? Because whenever I see that kind of defense about aligning with common sense intuitions, I immediately think, well, then what about quantum mechanics? And so I, then that seems to undermine this. So yeah, so uh, I've caught, I caught some quotations from Peter Menzies. I left some others in. But the ones I caught are actually directly on this. So maybe I should have left them. Um, the, the thought is that for at least some of these people, the goal is not to give an account of uh, causation as we find it in our actual physical universe, but it's to give a metaphysical account, which they take to be somehow broader. Right? So it's supposed to be tracking down causation as it could appear in any possible world, and so it's a, a, a sort of necessary account, but the theory has to be necessarily true. And then the thought is, um, yeah, causation might work in some particular peculiar way that we could investigate in the actual world. But if we wanted to figure out what causation was in this meta robust metaphysical necessary sense, then um, we would have to also consider all these other kinds of possibilities. And, and then some stuff that I will talk about is how exactly you go about constraining that either fixing the reference or figuring out that you haven't just um, changed the subject when you're talking about causation as opposed to right? maybe you've talked about something else. I, I will say a little bit more than that. I'm not sure that I find any of these replies satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that just, if you don't find that satisfying, then your reaction to that should be, oh, this is multiply in bad trouble. Right? This, kind of, this kind of approach is it's just over-determined that you shouldn't. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, some other some other people in the more contemporary uh, um, causation literature that uh, I take to be, if not explicitly giving conceptual analysis, at least they agree that they are massively constrained by ordinary causal attributions. So here's Joe Halpern. He said says this pretty explicitly in his uh, 2016 book. Uh, uh, here's Christopher Hitchcock. The two of these have a number of papers together in which they are trying to fit the ordinary attributions, and they say that uh, this is a, a constraint of their theory that uh, it should give, it should be able to recover common sense judgments. Um, Ned Hall uh, sets out, at least agrees that this is the, the general picture that metaphysicians are working under today. It's this sort of analytic thing. I'll come back to the Hall. Um, this this project is really, a, in a very deep sense, a response to uh, a paper of this from 2004, titled Rescued from the Rubbish Bin, um, where he sets out some challenge that I'll pick up and, and talk about a bit more, um, and then offers a, a kind of way to rescue the project. Right? So he recognizes the potential worry, and then he says, maybe there's something we can do that uh, will let us keep doing this conceptual uh, analysis kind of work that will let us keep trafficking in thought experiments and everything will be fine. Um, I think everything's not fine, and I'll try to, I'll try to say exactly why. But, um, so, so he has this picture. His, his particular views on, on the method have shifted a bit. In another paper in 2004, he's quite clear about laying out a bunch of uh, alternative projects that you might be engaged in. I think people have kind of lost sight of that. I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Um, it's a little unclear which of those he wanted to endorse, uh, but several of them have to do with um, ordinary attributions. And in this other paper, he's clear about trying to salvage the method. Um, more recently, in uh, his book with Laurie Paul uh, and Laurie independently, um, have argued for some pretty robust use of intuition in uh, developing the theories of causation. Maybe not uh, at the level of doing conceptual analysis, but um, certainly there's going to be a, a large constraining role that his intuitions are supposed to provoke our theorizing. And, um, function of something like data for our theorizing. All right. uh, Helen Beebe, um, I don't think exactly endorses this view, but she recognizes 
says explicitly that this is the sort of methodological approach that metaphysicians have been engaged in. And then she reflects a bit on um, how that might lead you to a skeptical position. I think that's right. That would lead you to a skeptical position. Uh, Carolina Sartorio says some very similar things in uh, her 2016 book on causation and free will. There's appeal to intuition all over the place and uh, case studies all over the place. Uh, David Armstrong doesn't think there's any conceptual an analysis of work to do, but he does think that this is the way to fix reference. Right? So if you're worried about what it is we're talking about when we're talking about causation and offering philosophical theories, um, he thinks the way to do that is uh, uh, something like the structure I'll look at in a little bit that's mostly is most famously pursued by Peter Menzies. Um, uh, and then there's uh, Sarah Bernstein, who's the only person I know of who very explicitly thinks this isn't what we're doing in metaphysics. Um, and I find it very puzzling, but I can't go into a lot of detail on, on exactly her position. But I want to make sure to flag for you that there are metaphysicians out there who don't think this is what they're up to, puzzling me what uh, Sarah thinks metaphysicians really are up to, but um, set that aside. Okay. So, um, so Lewis thinks we've got, to, we've got to do this conceptual analysis. Um, plausibly, you're doing that because you want to take in more ground than just the actual world. Uh, he develops uh, a nice approach, an interesting approach to, to doing conceptual analysis, uh, sometimes called Canberra planning. And then, then Peter Menzies in a uh, paper in the 80s, and then most, uh, most notably and clearly in this 1996 paper, advocated for Canberra planning for causation. Uh, so in, here's the, from the 96 paper. Uh, he says that having started from an attempt to give a probabilistic analysis, <coughs> he says, I think there's a residual element in our concept of causation, right? something that's, that's not which resists capture solely in terms of probabilistic concepts. So it's not some, it doesn't think you can give this straight reductive account. Um, and then he asks, how exactly is that residual element to be explained more precisely? How can we capture it? Uh, and he says the following. So we can provide a more precise explanation by treating the concept of causation as the concept of a theoretical entity. Uh, we can explain the concept then in the same manner as the concepts of other theoretical entities, such as quartz, genes, and species. The first step in doing that, providing a similar definition of the causal relation, is to set down the central tenets of our folk theory of causation, the platitudes about causation, which are common knowledge among us. Right? So he's going to try to capture um, this thing in the style that Lewis recommends for various things in the philosophy of mind, things like pain and mental states. Um, uh, he's going to try that with causation. We'll write down the platitudes. We'll try to capture. Uh, uh, we'll write a Ramsey sentence, right? There is something that satisfies all these platitudes. That will be uh, causation. Um, okay, so Menzies advocates for Canberra planning. Um, but surprisingly, somewhat infamously, Lewis denied that Canberra planning was going to work in the case of causation. He applies it in some other cases, but he doesn't like it for causation, even though one of his most important um, famous analyses is an analysis of causation. Um, he gives two reasons for um, rejecting Canberra planning with respect to causation. Causation is too, sorry, this should be too <laughs> <O's>. <laughs> Too varied. Yeah. Too varied. There are lots and lots and lots of things that causation could be. Um, and it doesn't look like there's any prima facie unity. He's worried that if you do Canberra planning, you're going to get something massively disjunctive, and that would be bad. Uh, and um, it isn't an appropriate target for uh, Canberra planning because it's not really a relation. And the reason it's not a relation is that sometimes there are a lot of go missing. You have causation by absence, you have prevention, you have double prevention, you have omissive. Right? There are places where either or both of the uh, things you might think of as relata of the causal relation aren't there. If you don't have any relata, you don't have a relation. And for some reason, he thinks, seems to think that uh, Canberra planning can't get you something like that. Right? It can't, can't deliver something that um, isn't like a property or relation or something. So, okay. uh, Liebesman has a really nice paper uh, in 2011 that I think just gives completely convincing replies to, uh, uh, to these problems, these worries that Lewis has for doing Canberra planning with respect to causation. 
Um, and, and so I, I just agree with him that Lewis should have been a Canberra planner for causation. So that would have been a better strategy, would have been more consistent with his own philosophy. And in general, Canberra planning looks like um, a more respectable way to do conceptual analysis than simply reflecting on the armchair, especially if you're willing to go out and, and do experimentation and take an experimental turn with your Canberra planner. Right. Okay, so um, upfront question, do we need to commit to Canberra planning for the main idea in my argument to work? I think probably not. I'm not going to go through the details on that um, and sort of assume that Canberra planning is, and planners are the target. Um, I'm going to do that mostly because I think this is the best way to make sense of a descriptive conceptual uh, analytic work. Uh, provided we take an experimental turn. So I, I take myself to be sort of steel manning the position. Right? I'm going to take the best version of this that I can and then show that it's not going to work. Um, if you think that I'm, that I'm cheating somehow there, please push me on that or show me why alternatives to never planning are better. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So, so now this is about the moment where the rubbish bin starts to threaten. So uh, Paul, in his 2004 paper, first just confirmed he, he characterizes the analytic goal like this. Right? If you're Lewis or somebody following Lewis, you want to come up with an account of causation that would recover in as elegant <coughs> fashion as possible all our firm pre-theoretic intuitions about hypothetical cases. And so this is what we're trying to do. We want to regiment this together. Um, and then he says, but, but wait, so here's this, here's this sort of basic ontological package. There's a, a view that people like Lewis are really sy sympathetic to. Um, it's attractive even if you don't ultimately like the view. It, it's got these sort of three parts. There's uh, some non-trivial distinction between the categorical and non-categorical truths. Truths like, here's a table, versus uh, this wouldn't be a table if I were to set it on fire and let it burn. Yeah? Um, one of those is a claim about what's actually here, and the other is some modal thing, has some modal um, Second, there are more or less fundamental categorical facts. You might think claims like, here's a table, not so fundamental. Uh, claims about um, electrons and protons, more fundamental. Uh, and then third, uh, the whole truth about a world is fixed by the most fundamental categorical truths about it together with its fundamental laws. Right? So the idea is that you can somehow, by reductions and other kinds of workings, you can get from uh, whatever those most fundamental things are, plus whatever the fundamental laws of nature are that govern those fundamental things, or describe them if you don't like governing talk, you can get uh, all these other facts that you care about to the actual world. All right. All right, but there are two challenges. So first challenge has a quick, uh, quick answer. How does causation fit into that story? Right? Um, most of the people in, in uh, the Lewis tradition don't think causation is in the fundamental um, facts. Right? Don't think that causation is, like, has any ontological heft to it in that sense. Uh, so so what, do, what do we do? Um, well, Hall says, well, Lewis has showed us more or less what to do here. You just reduce causation in such a way that its existence is consistent with that basic ontological fact. Right? Cash out in terms of counterfactual dependence, patterns of counterfactual dependence, and so on. Uh, but there's a more serious challenge. So Hall says, at any rate, the quick answer obscures a deeper challenge. To see what it is, we need to remember that for Lewis, a proper philosophical account of causation is supposed to be an analysis of our ordinary concept, and as such needs to pay careful heed to our intuitions about cases. The challenge is to say why anyone should care about such a thing. Right? So basically Jason's question from the beginning of the talk. Right? Why? What's the motivation for doing the Lewis thing if your goal is to tell this story about like the fundamental metaphysics? Okay. Um, Hall goes on and, and gives an argument uh, for thinking that there's a way to salvage. He thinks that what we should do is we should find a theoretically interesting, metaphysically engaged thing that our ordinary concept would do, and then we can be triumphant when we've actually got that analysis, we, we will have uh, produced something that has some value right, and engages with our metaphysical project. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's unlikely that we're going to get uh, a theoretically interesting for the metaphysician 
uh, view of causation out of our ordinary causal attributions. And so at this point, I want to just make some observations um, coming from empirical work. Um, I'm going to somewhat shamelessly just talk about my own empirical work and the empirical work of my uh, close collaborator, Justin Sitzma. Uh, there's a ton of other stuff out here. I'm also not going to talk about all of the empirical work that we've done that's relevant to this stuff. I'm just going to sort of pick some highlights. And I'll probably have to skip some stuff anyway because some of them are already um, going longish. Um, the, the, so the four kind of things I want to look at, uh, we've done dozens of experiments at this point with this uh, basic uh, case that was initially developed by Josh Noob that shows um, pretty clearly that people are very, very sensitive to uh, uh, what the broadly prescriptive norms are in a situation when they are making causal attributions. Um, that, that causes some trouble, presents some, some problems, puzzles for uh, uh, people like Menzies who, if I had a little more time, I'd talk to you about some of the assumptions that Menzies makes about what the platitudes are and why these experiments are already enough to show you that none of those are going to work. Um, we'll come back to some other things as well. But, so this is going to put pressure on things that metaphysicians tend to take as granted that, uh, in terms of the, what the broad goal is of their, of their project. I we'll also quote Helen Beebe here. Um, didn't include it, but she has a very nice passage where she um, is looking at causation by absence cases, and she says, uh, you might think that what's driving um, some of the intuitions here are judgments about responsibility that we have, uh, but that's not what metaphysicians are after. Right? So the metaphysical idea needs to be purely descriptive. Right? Okay. Uh, then I'm going to look at uh, some work that Justin and some others have done on purpose analyses, and um, I'll, I'll make this remark that maybe philosophers aren't such um, especially bad people after all. Um, this, this worry will be more salient after a couple of minutes here. It's a little salient. And then I'm going to talk about some other things that influence our causal attributions, uh, character, knowledge, and desire of agents that happen to be acting in these cases. And then I'm going to look at a thing that I find particularly troubling, failure of a constraint that I call the compositionality constraint which is endorsed by effective, almost every account, all but one of the theories of causation that I know of endorse this constraint. And the, the one that doesn't, um, I talked to its author and he said, yeah, yeah, it's probably not entailed by my view, but it's a necessary truth. And so, um, okay. Uh, all right, so uh, on the Lauren and Jane stuff, two cases to consider. You, uh, if you know the literature, you'll, you'll remember that these are challenges. Um, it's called a problem of isomorphism. It's a challenge to um, purely structural kinds of accounts of causation. Right, so we, we consider these cases. First is overdetermination. Billy and Susie both throw a rock at a window at the same time. Both rocks reach the window, shattering it on impact. Then we ask, right, did Billy cause the window to shatter? Did Susie? Did there their throws. And separately, consider this, bogus prevention. Killer plans to poison victim's coffee, but has a change of heart and refrains from administering the lethal poison. Bodyguard puts an antidote in the coffee that would have neutralized the poison had there been any present. Victim drinks the coffee and, of course, survives because like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just got a little extra antidote. Um, and the, the thought is that these two cases, when you describe them structurally, when you lay out what the causal laws are and when you dress, uh, dress up the counterfactual dependencies, uh, they're equivalent. They're just isomorphic to one another. But um, the causal judgments that people typically have in these cases are different. There seems to be an intuition of difference that Billy and Susie both cause the window to break, but um, uh, Killer declining to put poison into the, uh, into the coffee doesn't cause the victim to survive. And, and, um, bodyguard, put, sorry, bodyguard putting the antidote in the coffee doesn't cause the victim to survive. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, so uh, here's, the, here's the experimental case. Presented this vignette, uh, and then a bunch of different variations, and I'll walk through some of the variations. Um, 
Lauren and Jane both work for a company that uses a mainframe that can be accessed from terminals on different floors of this building. The mainframe has recently become unstable, so that if more than one person is logged in at the same time, the system crashes. Therefore, companies instituted a temporary policy restricting the use of terminals so that two terminals are not used at the same time until the mainframe is repaired. The policy prohibits logging into the mainframe from the terminal on any floor except the ground floor. One day, Lauren logged into the mainframe on the authorized terminal on the ground floor at the exact same time that Jane logged into the mainframe on the unauthorized terminal on the second floor. Lauren and Jane were both unaware that the other was logging in. Sure enough, the system crashed. Uh, structurally, this is the same as those other two cases. Uh, again, it seems that uh, the ordinary judgment is that there's a, a difference between this case and, and the others, and importantly, that there's a big difference between Lauren and Jane as to which of them uh, caused the outcome. Right? So we, we asked participants to indicate how strongly they agreed or disagreed with each of these claims on a standard Likert scale from one to seven. And Lauren caused the system to crash, Jane caused the system to crash. We did this both within subjects and between subjects. And within or between doesn't really make any difference. Um, that's a, on the left is uh, within subjects, on the right is between subjects. Uh, to remind, right, Lauren does something permissible, Jane does something impermissible. And what we find is that people say, yeah, Jane caused the system to crash. And they say, no, Lauren did not cause the system to crash. Okay. So um, this is this is problematic, uh, in part because you're taking a sort of metaphysician's perspective on it. You know, plausible constraints on causation are, are things like that it's an in, in, intrinsic relation, um, and that it has certain physical features. It doesn't look like whether the company has a rule against the thing that you're doing should matter for um, an account of causation. Uh, so we've made Lauren and Jane crash their computer system dozens of times at this point in lots of different ways. We've asked lots of different questions about it. We've also asked questions about um, whether the mainframe mattered. Um, we found uh, when we asked open-ended, gave sort of open-ended prompts for people, uh, and we only had the prompt that we, we just saw. Uh, people invented stuff that wasn't in the story, or they wanted to blame the IT people. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to blame the computer system, right? Um, which perfectly consistent with the view that Justin and I have that these things are more about finding someone to hold responsible right, than it is a uh, uh, metaphysical sense of causation. Um, but right, when, when you check, you find that uh, these things do matter. They, right, they want to say the mainframe caused uh, its own collapse, its own crash. They want to say that Jane, who did something unauthorized, caused the thing to crash. They don't want to say that Lauren caused it to crash. Um, we've done things where uh, we manipulated whether the instability of the mainframe was a feature or a bug. Uh, you might think that if the mainframe is unstable, because it's supposed to be, like it's doing a really careful calculation that's built in just the right way, it has to have the instability feature it does in order to do its work. That that might matter for the judgments that people make. Uh, and it does. Um, uh, but not, not relative to um, permissible, impermissible judgments. Um, we've done bizarre, this one was surprising when we first did it. We did a version where uh, we got rid of Jane altogether. We just have Lauren in the story. Right? And the story is simpler. It's if anybody logs in, then the system crashes. And then you vary with, you manipulate whether or not Lauren is permissibly logging in or not. Yeah. And you find in that case, um, uh, when she's doing something that is permissible, she's not judged to have caused it, even though she's the only one that's doing anything new, it's not taking any, any uh, substantive action. Okay, and we varied a bunch of things there. We, we varied how typical the thing was. We varied whether it was typical for Lauren. We varied um, whether it was uh, un, unusual for Lauren. We varied whether it was typical for people at the company, and thus you know, in the population at large, it might matter. Uh, and, and really, the only thing that drives this is whether it's permissible or impermissible on those things that we study. Later, we'll see some other things that, that do matter, um, but none of these things matter. Typicality doesn't matter uh, in, in, in real sense. Okay. Um, 
right, corpus analysis. So Justin and some other uh, some other folks have just done some analysis of uh, causal language in the field, as it were. So they've looked at a bunch of different corpora. Uh, two two main takeaways from their corpus analysis, as I read it. First, ordinary causal language is overwhelmingly negatively valenced. This is why I say maybe philosophers aren't so horrible after all, right? The early cases, if you look at the causation literature, a ton of it is mean, right? It's all like uh, assassins and victims and poisonings and shootings and stabbings and breakings of things. Um, that's ordinary. That's totally ordinary language, right? Um, uh, there's an overwhelming negative valence in just the way causation gets used ordinarily. Uh, if you look at uh, the ten nouns most frequently following the causal <coughs> phrase caused the in um, um, standard large corpus, this is the BYU corpus. Um, these, are, these are the ones death, accident, crash, problem, explosion, fire, collapse, injury, damage, and loss. Uh, and the counts of how often they happen in that, in that corpus. Uh, in the top 50 nouns following uh, cause the, independent readers categorize 30 of them as negative, 19 of them as neutral, and one of them as positive. So it looks like, in general, our causal language is um, built to be kind of. Uh, what is that one? Hmm? What is that one? I don't know. I, I, it I must be love. <laughs> All right, second takeaway. Um, philosophers actually use causal language very differently, at least in their academic writing. Um, and so maybe, it, maybe this explains why philosophers would be surprised that uh, the ordinary language right, wouldn't be metaphysically respectable, because the, uh, the kinds of things that seem to matter in ordinary language corpora don't seem to matter too much to philosophical writing on the topic. So this is um, uh, in a sorry in ordinary language corpora cause is very similar to terms like responsible. These are measures, cosine distance measures, um, uh, similarity for two different uh, natural language corpora, uh, blame and fault. But in a philosophy corpus, this is straight from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Cause has essentially no similarity to responsibility, blame, or fault. Right? These numbers are tiny. Uh, and if you do similar anal analyses looking at nearest neighbors, you get similar results. Uh, okay, so it looks like the ordinary language is seriously negatively balanced, seems to pattern like things like responsibility and blame. Um, it doesn't <coughs> look much like the metaphysical sense of causation. Um, what's going on? Right? What else might matter to uh, ordinary causal attributions, and what should we make of the mess we're starting to see? Uh, well, there are some different accounts. Um, one account is uh, Drew Mark Alec, who takes uh, what he sometimes calls culpable control model, I think of it as a blame validation model, where the idea is uh, you are rating things as causal because you want to blame them. And you say to yourself, if they didn't cause it, then uh, they, they aren't the sort of thing that I can blame. So you start with a blame judgment and then you rig up your causal judgments to match. Um, this picture takes these kinds of causal attributions to be importantly biased. And I think it's, it's a, a mistaken view. But let's look just at the, the most uh, important uh, bit of evidence that uh, Alec brings to bear for this. Uh, this is something that actually gets, gets replicated. Some of his other stuff has mostly failed to replicate. And so it's a little shakier. Um, all right, so Alan tells a story like this. Uh, there's this guy. He's, um, uh, he's driving home. The thing that Alec manipulates is why he's driving home. In one version of the story, he's driving home to hide a gift for his parents' anniversary that he left out. Um, he wants to get there before they get there and so that he can hide it or back it or something like that and give it to them at a better time. Uh, the other one is he's, uh, he's rushing home to hide some cocaine that he left out before his parents get there. Um, and then what he measures in this version is the percentage of people who call, sorry, John gets into a car wreck on his way, on his way driving home. And then he's, where the participants are asked um, for the percent, sorry, asked what is the primary cause of the accident. And um, Alan also manipulates what else was involved, right? What are the additional causes aside from 
uh, the character in the story. So in one story, uh, John is rushing home and hits an oil slick and crashes. In another, he uh, runs into a tree. In another, he runs into a car. Uh, and the primary, the percentage calling John the primary cause looks like this. In the cocaine case, right, um, it's this blue line. So almost 100% in the, in the oil case, uh, just over 50% in the car case. When I say John was the primary uh, cause. And in the gift case, right, there's a substantial difference. The difference like 25 percentage points. It's pretty consistent. <coughs> All right. He also did similar, um, recorded similar measurements for um, average responsibility rating and average causal rating among the participants on something like liquor scales. And he asked, uh, took a measure of how much uh, John should pay in compensation right? and found differences for those. These differences, I think, are really tiny. They also fit with the kind of picture that Justin and I have. Um, in these causal attributions is mostly responsibility since they're tracking the same pattern. All right, so we replicated this, but we had a, we had a conjecture. So the conjecture is um, what's driving Alex's result here is that uh, your cocaine habit is plausibly related to your driving ability. Yeah? If you've got a, a bad enough cocaine habit, you've left cocaine out for your parents <coughs> to maybe discover it, um, probably not trustworthy as a as a driver. And the, the thought is that people might infer, right, make an inference that John is not a very good driver, and then we're not a safe or, or reliable driver, and then that would uh, explain the difference between uh, the, those two cases, right? It's not about his character, it's about his credibility. So uh, we replicated with a vignette that describes a person as having either good or bad character. Um, this was, I think, uh, torturing cats in their spare time, uh, or, or uh, working at a local soup kitchen in their spare time, right? so you can drive character as either good or bad, but in a way that doesn't have an obvious relation to driving ability. And we find, in, in that case, there's, there's no difference on, on these. There's no difference on um, uh, whether, uh, sorry, the percentage of primary cause judgments, and there's no difference in responsibility or causation judgments. There is a difference in compensatory damage judgments. Uh, so it's not that people aren't, aren't picking up on and wanting to say something bad about the person that has bad character. They think the person with bad character should pay more for the accident. They just don't think that person right, was any more possible. Uh, however, if you vary driving ability explicitly, you do get pretty much the difference that Alec observes, which seems to um, uh, do a better job really, of explaining what's going on in, in those cases. All right. Uh, we also varied character of the agent in the familiar Lauren crashing the computer system case, and you find something very similar. Um, the uh, having, uh, having a bad character really doesn't matter independent of there being a norm involved, uh, except in this case where uh, Lauren is described as a bad person, but there's no normative stuff in the story itself, right? So we don't, we say that the system is unstable, but we don't have the company issuing a, a policy. And here we think what's going on is that people are inferring that she's doing it intentionally. Right? Somehow she's gotten on to things being the way they are, and because she's a bad person, she's crashing the system. Okay, uh, having, having made that guess, uh, we checked some other features of her, whether um, she had foreknowledge about whether her action would cause the crash, uh, whether she had a desire for the bad instinct to occur, and we did that in a two by two. And so, uh, and we uh, changed that across whether it was normatively, whether there were norms in the story or not. Right? And you find that uh, when there are norms in the story, right, she's always responsible, always judged causal um, for these things. When there aren't, it seems to depend a bit on whether she knows. Here's the case where she knows. You see that, that this is trending up. Uh, here's a case where she desires but doesn't know, probably not different. Um, this one where she knows and desires is clearly different. Right? She knows what she's going to do is going to crash the system. She wants to crash the system. Um, oh yeah, she caused it. Okay, and uh, we've varied with, uh, what people say when she is ordered to log in by her boss 
despite having you know, everybody knowing and the board reminding the boss this is going to crash the system or it's likely to crash the system. Yeah. Uh, and we find that uh, Lauren, Lauren is not judged causal in these cases, but the boss is. This is going to be important for the next thing, composition element. All right, so some more observations. Um, here's a, here's a, an initially, I think, quite plausible constraint on theories of causation, accounts of causation. Uh, I call it the compositionality constraint. It works like this. Uh, it's kind of the mirror image of transitivity. I have to get a handle on it. It's not transitivity, but it's, it's sort of the reverse of it. <coughs> if you've got causation from C to E, then one of two things is the case. Either C causes E directly, or C causes E by an intermediary or some collection of intermediaries. And for every one of those intermediaries, C causes it, and it causes E. Right? So you can think of it as every causal connection uh, gets built out of, um, or composed up out of uh, smaller bits, or it's the smallest bit possible. Okay, so call it compositionality constraint. Lots of theories of causation in the philosophical literature entail the compositionality constraint or some close variation on it. Um, here are a few of them. There are others. Uh, they, these span, um, span across important differences that you might think are, are really salient. So like, these are supposed to be more physical causal process kinds of views, um, productive in character. These are more dependence kinds of views. Um, they're not all about causal process. They all endorse this compositionality view. Um, but uh, I've had my doubts. I first started having doubts when I was thinking about uh, voter fraud and how I wanted to think about causal attributions in cases of voter fraud. It seems to me that if someone defrauds some voters such that um, they vote in a way that matters to the outcome, the person that's doing the defrauding causes the outcome to be what it is and not the other thing. But the individual voters really don't. Um, if you've got the, the metaphysical compositionality kind of thought, that should look very deeply weird. Um, because, of course, the fraud can only matter to the outcome by way of the voters. Okay, so since I was sort of inclined to that, but I like the compositionality constraint, I wanted to know do ordinary people um, respect this thing? Justin and I conjectured that. If the ordinary default concept of causation is, as we think, like a uh, concept of responsibility, it's got moral content, normative content sort of built into it, um, then the compositionality constraint won't hold in cases where uh, the responsible party brings about an effect through an intermediary that doesn't have a share in that responsibility. Right? So like the voting case. The voters don't do anything wrong in that case. They've been defrauded. Right? Their votes literally matter to the outcome, but uh, they're not responsible for it. And that might explain why you want to say that the fraud, or I want to say that the fraud, um, is the cause of the outcome, but not the individual voters in that case. All right, so we got some sort of simpler cases. We tested a few of these. Uh, uh, four cases, two where the intermediary is an agent who is an unwitting accomplice to a crime, one where the intermediary is an employee following a lawful but stupid order, that's the Lord and the boss case. Um, and one where the intermediaries are components in a mechanism. And then we followed up with a fifth case where the, we tried to make the causal factors non-agents. Okay. There's still some agents in the story, but they're not causally relevant to what's going on in this story. Okay. Uh, and we found that in those cases, and we think in the cases that are structurally like them, uh, the, the compositionality constraint fails. I'm not going to go through all of these. we will work through just a couple. Um, uh, I'll give you a version of the poisoned cup case. We did this in a couple of ways because people always complain about this. Um, well, generally philosophers complain about this, right? metaphysicians for sure. Our first version is, is sort of action-centered. Sorry, our, our first version is um, agent-centered, just describing as did the agents cause the bad outcome. And people say, oh, I, don't, I don't like agent causation. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, maybe it mattered that you were talking about agents and not events or something like that. So we've, we've redone this with uh, focus on actions, focusing on event descriptions, it doesn't matter if people make the same judgments. Um, all right, so I'm just, I'll just give you the first one. Um, there's another worry that, that we also followed up a replication on. I'll tell you the worry, but I won't go into detail on how this goes. And then I'm going to skip over a couple of others and talk about this one. Which is kind of all right, five minutes. Five minutes. All right, I will go quite fast. Um, right. 
Okay, so uh, sometimes this sort of thing happens right, in, in real life. Uh, it's, it's a pity. Uh, this is from the U.S., Kansas City, Missouri, uh, where mother poisons her, uh, her baby by giving uh, rubbing alcohol. Uh, so here's the case we presented to participants. I say that because right, Lewis has this constraint. Can't be a far-fetched case. Right? Can't be a far-fetched case. Otherwise, it's, it's no good. But if it's not a far-fetched case and you have strong intuitions, then the theory had better respect it, right? Okay, so not a far-fetched case. These are real-life kinds of cases, right? uh, Amy wants to kill her daughter, Jessica, but she doesn't want to go to prison for murder. As such, she hatches a plan. She arranges for a babysitter, Courtney, to take care of Jessica while she is out of town on business. Before leaving, Amy laces one of Jessica's sippy cups with a deadly poison and is very difficult to detect. That evening, Courtney gives Jessica juice in the poison sippy cup, Jessica drinks the juice and dies two hours later. And we ask um, people to evaluate whether Amy caused Jessica's death and whether Courtney caused Jessica's death on that usual 1 to 7 scale. Uh, I'll say up front, here's the model that we had, the structural model we had for the case. Right? That a thing that Amy does causes a thing that Courtney does, which causes Jessica to die. Yeah? And it's this causal chain. There's a worry you might have here. We tested for that worry. You might, you might worry that. The actual picture is a collider with Amy and Courtney acting independently to cause Jessica. That depends, I think, quite, it's quite sensitive to how you characterize the variables in the case. And so we did some work to try to get people to understand the variables in a chain way and not in a collider way. Right. Having said that, I'll skip over that. All right. Um, so if this is the right picture, and if Amy is judged to cause Jessica to die, then Courtney had better be judged to cause Jessica to die because Amy doesn't have any other direct route. Yeah? Uh, that's why we're going to be testing the two things. Yeah? Okay, and here are the judgments. They're so stark that there's, there aren't really any um, statistics to compute here. There's no variance. Yeah? Um, so in the, in the Amy caused judgment, um, everybody, literally everybody we looked at, uh, was awake and gave us a seven. Yeah? Um, and in the Courtney caused case, that's almost almost reversed from it. Okay. Um, I actually did some statistics, but they're not the usual ones. You can't do tests of difference between these things. So, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. We repeated the story, trying to get um, you know, pull out a, a chain model. Right? No, no significant interesting difference when you do that. Uh, it's still the same story. We saw the results on this, but we did the same thing again with Lauren and her grumpy boss, right? Who tells her to log in, even though she knows that this is a really bad idea to log in. Uh, and uh, what we find is that the boss is judged as causing the computer to crash. Lauren is not judged as causing the computer to crash. Um, these all seem like pretty firm views that people have, uh, at least in the aggregate. Uh, we also tried to remove relevant agents. Uh, we set up a case for the sake of time. Yeah. Um, you get the picture. Yeah? There are a bunch of these kinds of things. It looks like uh, our uh, ordinary, right, uh, our ordinary causal attributions look uh, like responsibility style attributions. They look like they're sensitive to a bunch of things that metaphysicians would typically not take them to be sensitive to. They're sensitive to whether there are norms that are operative in the world, whether these are smart things to do, whether people uh, have foreknowledge about what they're doing, whether they have desire for the thing to happen. Um, right? those, are, those are the sorts of things that I take it uh, no metaphysician is really interested in capturing. Maybe they should be. Maybe they should change their <coughs> and they should just accept uh, the, the old desideratum that they've had so far um, and embrace what comes of it and say that the metaphysics of causation has this, this content. But uh, so far they haven't uh, wanted that kind of view. If that's what you want, if, if you think that's a constraint on, on material metaphysics of causation, that it be this sort of purely descriptive thing, that it have interesting connections to our physical theories and not have anything to say about uh, the norms and uh, what we know and what we desire and things like that, uh, then uh, if you do some Canberra planning, you're going to see that you're not going to get, right? You're not going to get the thing you want out of this kind of um, approach, you know, this kind of analysis. Okay. So, um, so what now? 
obvious alternatives, right? You can uh, follow the FAD, the folk attribution desideratum, right? uh, and uh, do things like reject compositionality, embrace that uh, causation has these normative elements, that that's what causation is. Or you can um, accept the constraint, you can reject the, these normative elements and stop following the FAD, right? stop being FADish. Um, we think there are actually some more additional interesting things that you could do. Those are like, both a little too extreme and a little too quick. You just jump into those. Um, so here are some other things you could do under the umbrella of research on causation. And there are some things where it might be so quite interesting for uh, doing this kind of case-based work. Um, right. So uh, the upshot here is that philosophers may reasonably accept or reject that folk attribution does wrong. They may reasonably accept or reject uh, the method that goes with the traditional metaphysical approaches to different degrees, depending on the type of project they're pursuing. But they should just be very clear about what the project is that they have in mind and whether the method is actually suited to the thing that, um, that they're trying to do. Uh, and I'll, I'll just mention these. I'm not going to go into any detail, but if you have questions and want to see in more detail what these kinds of things might look like, I can go back to them. Um, or we'll, I'll just stop at this point. We could go forward from here. Um, <coughs> the, things, the things that we think are sort of on the table minimally are like descriptive conceptual analysis or something that's more normatively engaged with like conceptual engineering or ameliorative analysis or something like that. Um, descriptive psychology, <coughs> which comes apart from conceptual analysis in that uh, you, might, uh, not in, you might not need to endorse that to do descriptive psychology. You might care about like what are the sorts of things that influence people's judgments without ever giving a, a theory right, of uh, like a folk theory of those judgments. And you can do all sorts of descriptive stuff about what the psychology is like. You can also get into um, issues about what you think the psychological mechanisms are without having anything to do or say about the fad. Right? So um, this is going to be empirically engaged, but not necessarily faddish. Uh, and then there's realist metaphysics. and. I've given you my argument for why we shouldn't think we're going to get realist metaphysics out of uh, this, this kind of an approach. Um, you might try to come back and, and push in various ways. I haven't tried to set up like what the complaints are. I'll leave that to you, and then we can talk about it. Uh, down the road. 